Hey, y'all. I'm excited to present to you another episode of Mom Strength. I'm your host, Surabhi Beach, and we have on today one of the physiotherapists that I've known for the longest, Joanne Oposidolo. We have known each other since, I want to say 2010. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. 2010, 2011. Um, because Joanne was one of the physiotherapists who was working at the clinic where I did one of my final placements in physio school. So she was one of my mentors since then. And it's been incredible to reconnect now many, many years later. Um, so Joanne is a registered physiotherapist in Ontario, a certified pelvic health therapist. She's got over 10 years, I think even more years experience and um, comes with a wealth of information regarding pelvic health, core, diaphragmatic breathing, educating, managing treatment, managing and treating symptoms of reproductive health issues, such as endometriosis and uterine fibroids. Um, in addition to all the pregnancy, postpartum, menopause care, right? So one of her goals in life is to create positive, direct, and generational impact by empowering women to have a healthy relationship with their pelvic and reproductive health. This is incredible. I'm so excited to have you on here. I'm so excited to be here. Honestly, like I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you are I the sweetest. I always say that. <laughs> I know. And you know what? It is, um, it's like you say the things that I know I need to hear. Yeah. It's like, you're very good at, I feel like you're obviously very good with people, but you're also really good at seeing people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Kind of just like seeing what people need, um, which translates to your work, obviously as a physiotherapist as well. So tell me a little bit about a, where do you work now? What do you do now? What kind of populations you serve now? Yeah. So I currently work at uh, Toronto athletic club as well as one elephant clinic. Um, the one in Toronto Athletic Club is in downtown Toronto. One Elephant is in Oakville. Um, they're both fantastic, phenomenal places, but with very different vibes. Um, with Toronto Athletic Club, it is downtown. So the majority of the people there are very much uh, type A driven <laughs> to an yeah. extent. Very, very focused on results and goal oriented. Um, and in One Elephant, I'm part of this really beautiful clinic that was created by three women, two of who I know from mm. undergrad. Wow. And one that is, um, I don't know, we connected, but my brother also knows her. So it was just like a fantastic fit. And they created this beautiful interdisciplinary clinic in Oakville. And um, you can definitely feel the vibe and the connections from there. Mm. So for me, both of those places is, are important for me because I really enjoy and see the power of working in interdisciplinary teams. It is so important and it is so essential to people's overall, overall well-being. So the one thing that I want to say about Toronto Athletic Club is that it is attached to a gym and it is a fantastic gym. So mm. patients have the access to go and work out before or after their treatment space. That's incredible. Order. Yeah. And sometimes they don't have that time or they're unable to carve out that time. So being able to actually have that associated with pelvic health or physiotherapy is essential. So they can actually put what we've discussed in action in their day to day, which is phenomenal. Yeah. And I feel like it also allows people to like when you enter a physio space with a gym attached Mm-hmm. you're also thinking, okay, I'm going to get back to that because a lot of people who enter physiotherapy think, oh, I got to stop running. I got to stop doing this. Mm-hmm. My physio is going to tell me it's bad for my knees, bad for my prolapse. So when you see a gym space, you see people working out, you're starting to feel a bit more positive as you enter that space thinking, oh yeah, these are the things that they're going to help me get back to. Um, and yeah. you know, that's both, both settings sound very different and pretty like really awesome. I used to work in Yorkville Mm -hmm. and that's the closest to kind of that downtown crowd I've worked with, Mm -hmm. but I, I, I totally see it downtown Mm -hmm. Toronto, very Mm -hmm. busy, Mm -hmm. lots of people working in, um, demanding jobs and Mm -hmm. they want to get better yesterday. So how do you manage that pressure as a clinician? That's a fantastic question. I think in the beginning, not I think, in the beginning when I first started working, uh, the pressure definitely got to me. But as I settled into my own and into my own space, I realized that I'm actually creating a really safe space for them to let go. 
So then this means that the pressure that they're bringing in, as soon as they walk into the space, I'm inviting them to let that go. I'm inviting them to actually sit, be present, and to honor their body and be an active participant in the treatment that they're receiving. Yeah. So what you choose to do after the treatment is telling. You can definitely pick up your baggage and keep on going, or you can choose to look at it a different way. Mm. But that pressure that they bring in, no, that's a my the bubble that I have created. Um, it's precious, and I do know that patients really appreciate it too. Yeah, the prior seeking someone to bring them down, no, because if you meet yeah. their energy with even more like that kind yeah. of pressure, they probably yeah. even get more riled up. And yeah, meeting them with that ability of like, here you can actually let go. Yeah, um, because I remember working at, in Midtown, Young and Eglinton, which also had a lot of those, the same crowd, mm-hmm. you know, people would come in and be like on their phone the entire session. Mm. Um, they're like, I, I, I got to take this. And I'm like thinking like, I feel like not that there's anything wrong with estheticians or like nail, you know, people who do nails. I just felt like you're not actually here to participate in your rehab. Mm-hmm. You think this is a spa day mm-hmm. where you can just check out or do your own thing. Mm-hmm. And people don't get better that way, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or they, maybe the, what they, what the, the thing they get is very temporary, right. The, mm-hmm. the effects when they're not participating. So I like that you use that word participating. Yeah. Can you talk about how you set an environment? Because this is really important. And I think a lot of physiotherapists, when we go to school, we don't really learn this in school. Mm -hmm. This is something we learn either on the job or you're just naturally good at it. Or you have mentors like you who model that. How do you set that um, environment for collaborative care versus the, I'm the therapist. I know better. I'm the expert. You have to listen to me. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you approach that? That starts from the get go. From the initial intake, as soon as I introduce myself to you, and as soon as I start to ask questions regarding what it is, it is interwoven and is integrated in every question that I ask. I want you to understand that you are the custodian of your own care and that you are going to be in the driver's seat. I'm here to guide. So questions such as like, what are your goals? What's your primary health concern? What does it mean to you? Okay. And then also, what do you hope to achieve? How does that look like? What does that look like? So then that way they can actually start to see that it's not just an injury specifically, but the ramifications of them getting better or not getting better, that also falls on them too. Yeah. And so- I think this is just, um, you just said something that was so key. And I remember as a physio student and a new graduate, our profs always told us, oh, you just um, ask them their goals and you get them back to their goals. And so sometimes I would ask my patients, what are your goals? I want this pain to go away. I want, Mm -hmm. it was always pain management, but when you're able to, the way you're approaching those questions, like, what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Like that, I think then identifies what their actual goals are. Mm Because obviously nobody wants pain, but Mm -hmm. what is that actually going to allow them to do? And I think the way you phrased it is like, I wish that was just how it was taught rather than, oh yeah, you just get back. Everyone has active goals. You just get them back to that. I'm like, that's not true. Sometimes it's not an active goal. Sometimes it's being able to like get through the work day, right? Exactly. Which, which is not necessarily an activity, like physical activity, but it might be a uh, well-being and, you know, pay the bills activity. So yeah. And also as I'm asking those questions, I'm getting an idea of who they are like their identity and also their culture and what it means to them and what that looks like and how that's actually going to be seen. So the way that the questions are generated and the way that I ask for sure is definitely going to be curated for each individual person so it can resonate with them. But I'm really trying to get an idea of like, who are you? Who are you becoming? And how can we get you to that point? And like, yeah, it may be an injury, but there's something else going on down there. Yeah. Yeah. And for people like you work with people with endometriosis and and fibroids. And I feel like that population, especially with endometriosis, is so um, poorly served for so Mm -hmm. long that when they're finally coming to see you, you don't want to 
<laughs> you don't want to screw it up for them or yeah. make them feel like, oh, they're, that's another practitioner they wasted their time with. Yeah. And so I think it's really special when you're able to create that environment and still make them feel like they're in the driver's seat when they're yeah. probably not used to feeling in control of their body. Yeah. And I find that a lot of pelvic health concerns, and I'm just going to generalize it first. I was beginning to see a lot of patterns of being dismissed and gaslighted. So with endometriosis and uterine fibroids, endometriosis specifically, it has so many different symptoms that can be seen as either gynae or GI. So then they get misdiagnosed a lot. And then and then research shows that it almost takes them seven to 10 years to actually have a diagnosis. With uterine fibroids, because they're so prevalent, it's almost become normalized to have uterine fibroids and to kind of like grit your teeth and bear it, kind of like go through with that. So as I started to delve into this space a lot, the women and the people who I was serving as it pertained to this condition the underlying aspect of it was the fact that no one actually truly listened to their concerns. Mm. No one really took the time to actually be like, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I see and I hear these symptoms. And no one took the time to actually start to connect the dots. And with that, I could see just in terms of pelvic health in itself, there's a lot of uh, cookie cutter kind of protocols that we kind of push people through right. as opposed to actually like sitting and actually listening to what concerns them, what issues that they have and what that means to them. So as I'm going through this process as a public health physiotherapist, um, that to me is so important because when people are seen they can actually truly be who they are in a genuine, authentic way. And they can actually really become active participants within their care and within their entire life. So then this means that the condition that they may come in with is not actually ruling them, but they have some control over it. Or if they don't have control over certain things, their mindset can actually shift and how they can manage it in a way that makes sense and honors them. Yeah. You're giving people back, not even giving, but you're allowing people to see that they do have control over their lives. And yeah. despite how, however, you know, many years they might have been suffering with something um, and that listening, that active listening and validating their experience. Um, because I remember earlier in my career, people used to, I hate even using this term, but catastrophize. Mm -hmm. Like I would see someone coming and, and I'm like, why are they constantly telling me their pain is 10 out of 10? Like, I, I know it is, mm -hmm. but I started to realize it's because most people they've told don't believe them. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. they're having to say that they like the whole session, they're just telling me how bad it is. Yeah. So now I, I think just even recognizing at the beginning of the session, <clears throat> excuse me, how bad it is for them, validating that they can feel like, oh, you you do get it. You yeah. you do believe me. Yeah. Because I, I don't know what, why in our healthcare system, we think clients are just malingerers. Like I think, yeah. I think we got too roped up with this insurance world and watched too many TV shows. Cause I'm like, you really think busy people who have much, many other things to do yeah. are really out to lie and lie about their pain. Like why they have better things to do. So it's they like- they really do, right? Like, especially downtown Toronto, you think they have time to waste? No. no. So it's approaching that. It sounds like what you're doing is it really approaching people with respect and care yeah. right off yeah. the bat. <clears throat> and a consideration, you mentioned that briefly, but like the culture, right? What's the culture yeah. around them? Not just their ethnicity, but like, who are they? Do they have mm -hmm. a lawyer culture around them? Do they mm -hmm. have, you know, what is their um, environment like? Mm -hmm. so can you speak to a little bit about cultural con considerations? Because this is something I really am passionate about. And I yeah. think that it's was basically not taught in school. So <laughs> I, cultural consideration for me, as I, this is an interesting topic um, because I feel like it started from the get-go. Um, I am Nigerian. I was raised in London, England, and then I came here to Canada. So I've straddled different cultures 
and integrated them in different ways in order to be understood mm. and also in order to survive, actually, just basic survival. So it's a skill set that I had that I didn't really know I had until I started to talk to other people. And I was like, mm, that's different. <laughs> and I feel like within our healthcare system, the way that we practice medicine and the way that we practice healthcare here sometimes does it disregards where someone is coming from and their capacity and the resources that they have. Mm. So if we are asking someone to follow a prototype for, okay, this is the type of exercise that you should be doing and you should be doing this three times a day, et cetera, et cetera, without any regard to what space they live in, who they are responsible for, the capacity that they have. Is this something that they even want to do? Mm. So when we talk about culture, we're talking about cultural competency and also cultural humility. What I hate the term cultural competent because it's like, okay, you just get to a point and you're like, got it. I'm competent. I know yeah. there's like, there's no end end game with this. Like you're constantly learning about yeah. you, you. You have to constantly learn and evolve. And, you know, I, I was thinking the other day, I was like, I want to like put a map up and just see like how many countries of the world or regions of the world do I know people from just personally? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do I know people from all areas of the world? Because in my head, I'm like, yeah, I know someone from everywhere. I know all someone from all religions, like personally as a friend or as a client mm -hmm. or somebody I went to school with. But that's not true. And just because mm -hmm. I know somebody doesn't mean I know everything about them, right? And then, yeah. and then we have to consider that there's many PTs <laughs> and healthcare professionals that know like 99% of people just from one ethnicity, yeah. and they might know one token, you know, brown or black person, and then yeah. it's assumed that they know enough. Yeah, yeah. So it's what you're saying is so, um, it's so important. It is. And it's, it's not an, it's not like a, Oh, if they're not getting better, let's consider this. It's mm -hmm. right off the bat. That's something you need to consider, right? It is. And I think like one of the best examples that I can definitely think about is, um, and I do want to talk a little bit about cultural humility, which is kind of like getting the patient or getting the client or anyone to teach you about what their culture means to them. And the best example of this is you can have five different people from the same family group. Okay. So let's take five siblings. Yeah. And each person will experience their culture in a different yes. way because it depends on their gender, socioeconomic status. It depends on how the intersections between them are so vast that one person saying that they're from one specific country and another person saying that they're from the same country, they present in different ways. Yeah. That's unfair to be like, oh, I know one person from Nigeria, so they're from yeah, so they're all the same. Exactly. And you're like thinking, you're like, do you know how diverse Nigeria is? Like, exactly. you know, yeah. and um, it's true because we wouldn't say that about, you know, Canadians have their stereotypes. Everybody likes hockey, and I don't yeah. know Tim Hortons or something. And I'm like, I don't like either. So you know, <laughs> it's like, it, it's just we can't. These stereotypes exist for a reason, but they also exist to harm. In in most mm -hmm. cases, they are mm -hmm. harmful, and um even if they're innocent, right? Oh, yeah. Asians are good at math. And it's like, yeah. you think that's innocent. You think that's a compliment, but it's actually really harmful. It is. And I love that you consider that as a right off the bat, because mm -hmm. I think when people come to your space and they can sense that you're respecting their cultural, just their culture in general, or even mm -hmm. respected that, respecting that that has an impact on treatment. Right. Yes. We think the things that have an impact on treatment are the exercises you do and how um, compliant, I hate that term too, compliancy yeah. of the patient. Right. And you're like, how about how compliant the therapist is to the patient? Right. How dedicated are you to be there for them, understand them and respect them? And so yeah. what you're doing is modeling that for your team and for your clients. And I think yeah. that that's, how, that's the value, right. That you have, that's, um, you can't put a price tag on that, right? Like no. people, you you really can't quantify that, the value yeah. that that brings. 
And I think it definitely spans into different ways of thinking. And one of the things that when I even think about culture and even how interwoven it is, is when it actually comes to birthing practices. So how people deliver, how people uh, carry, and then the postpartum care that's associated it with it as well. So for example, um, I think about different groups of people that I've treated where having an epidural and having a vaginal delivery is what is necessary, is the gold what? standard. Yeah, that's what everybody does. Yeah. And I have had other individuals where having an epidural is like a no-go. Yeah. It's like, no, I will grit my teeth and I will bear this. Yeah. And also having people who have had to have emergency C-sections and seeing them afterwards and understanding that that wasn't part of their idea Mm. or what their culture defines of having a quote unquote natural delivery. Yes. Whereas some people having a C-section, they're like, yeah, I have a planned C-section. I planned it. I like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So being able to understand a person and what that means to them, you can really begin to help and assist in terms of like how they heal Mm. and the treatment protocols and the treatment that you design for them in order to ensure that they are getting what they need to become whole. Yeah. And I find that was very interesting when I kind of locked into that aspect of birthing practices as it as it depends on culture because birth in itself labor and delivery pregnancy it's such a huge transitional point in time and it is a really special time I love working with pregnant women I love it love working with pregnant people and I also feel like the community of support that they require in that time pre, during, and post, it's not enough. Mm. It's not enough. It's not. Yeah. And I can see in different cultures that that community existed, but in different ways, but there was still a community. But the culture in which I see here, um, I can see people crave that, but now they have to pay for it. Yes. Because you, you've got to pay, like... I think that's the part we are, we obviously are lacking that village, but Mm -hmm. even when you go to see a healthcare provider, I, this is a totally um, different example, but I was at a market holiday market last weekend and there was Mm -hmm. a booth from um, they were selling moccasins and indigenous Mm -hmm. native jewelry. And it was from Mm -hmm. the Nagoda um, peoples in like Western Canada. And they were, he was saying, you know, Oh, you're a physiotherapist. You work with, you know, birthing the population, you should have um, like sage, sweet grass, or tobacco, like little satch- uh, little bags with you to give to your patients who are indigenous, they will really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that I'm like, okay, I'm going to incorporate that. But if you never talk to people, and you never understood people and why mm-hmm. that's relevant, you would think, why would you give tobacco to someone, right? That's a that's a drug. But even just understanding like this is going to help that person feel like, oh, you see them and yeah. you understand, you know, that you respect them. Yeah. And so I think that what you've said is so bang on. There are some people who are like, yeah, C-section, no problem. I had three C-section, I had four, like, versus from my culture, it would have been seen as a failure, mm. right? And so for me, I put a lot of pressure on myself to have vaginal births, unmedicated births, even though, you know, I was like, common sense is it really doesn't matter at the end of the day, you yeah. know, as long as it, you're healthy, but there's so much impact when you have 30, 35 years of cultural experience, you're not going to change that person's mind about their beliefs. Yeah. Instead, what we can do as the physiotherapist is support them in yeah. healing, regardless yeah. of what happens. Yeah. Right. And dispel the shame associated with it. Yes. Because that in itself, that is, that is deep. It is. That is, 
<laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm also crying inside. I know. <laughs> well, because sometimes culture can be really productive and yeah. supportive. Yes. And sometimes you're you're like, mm, that's not a positive belief or like no. that. Like, it's interesting because for me, you know, there's, I identify with so much what, you, what you've said with the intersecting of different cultures. You know, I'm Indian. I lived in Bahrain in the Middle East for a couple of yeah. years. Then I moved yeah. to Canada. Yeah. And then I struggled with my identity and like trying to fit in, just speak more yeah. Canadian. Then people won't notice that I'm not Canadian. And I'm like, that doesn't quite work when you are visibly not white and, you know, you have an accent or, you know, you sound different or yeah. any, you have a different religion or whatever, what they consider different. And I realized it's like, <clears throat> there's so much shame in both cultures, Canadian mm. culture and Indian culture. And somehow as women, we tend to absorb the shame from every culture that we're part of. Oh, right. And so oh. I'm carrying the shame for my you know, Indian culture. And then I'm carrying the shame from the Western culture that says you got to bounce back because Indian culture doesn't care about bouncing back. Right. They're like, listen, the more curvy, the better, like you, you, you're healthier looking like all that stuff versus Canadian culture. It's like, oh, well, in six weeks, you got to fit into your old pants. Mm. And so here, I, here we are as new moms trying to navigate like motherhood, sleep deprivation, breastfeeding or whatever else. And then you've got all the shame and baggage you've carried with you from, you know, all parties. And I think as a physiotherapist, being able to recognize that and um, diffuse some of that stigma and shame around their bodies, I think is yeah. so it's not stuff we're taught about in school, but it is so necessary, especially in public health. I love that you said that in terms of like the various shames and yeah. the fact that women tend to carry the brunt of it. We just take it all. We're like, yeah, oh. give, give me more. <laughs> oh. So what I want to ask you is how did you navigate that? So you as know what you I love about this? You're so good at asking questions. I was like, I have to try really hard to make sure that Joanne doesn't interview me for my body for your <laughs> this interview. <laughs> and I was like, I knew this was coming. But you know what? I love this because this is a this is a conversation. Um, <clears throat> uh, how did I navigate that same? I'm still navigating that shame. Mm. So actually, I had two unmedicated births. I had two home births. So I was mm. like, yep, I'm successful, right? Mm. But then my postpartum mm. experience like all the, there was no bouncing back. There was all this leakage prolapse that my mom was like, ah, it doesn't matter. Right. Like who cares? Like there was no like stigma or shame from the Indian side, but it was the Canadian side of like, Oh, you're a woman. You should, this is what equals being whole and complete. Mm. And, mm. um, you know, Oh, you lose your sexuality. If you have that mommy pooch or, mm. you know, that, that loose skin. And so mm. again, this was never part of Indian culture. It probably is part of Indian culture now because of the the effects of colonization and white supremacy worldwide and yeah. everyone trying to emulate quote unquote Western Eurocentric culture. But yeah. back when I grew up in India in the nineties, eighties, sorry, eighties and nineties, um, that was never a pressure that I felt. Yeah. So it was interesting because I was unpacking so much shame that I didn't know I had because prior to having kids, I did fit into the stereotypical thin, you know, mm. flat stomach, mm -hmm. whatever, athletic <laughs> standards of beauty as much as I could not being a white Eurocentric person. Um, and then I had kids and I was like, whoa, this brings essentially what happens is this brings me further away from what this society considers beautiful. How mm. am I going to navigate that? And I started to realize, wow, did I really care that much what other people think? Uh, yes, I did. Mm. And so even understanding like, what are my values and priorities? How do I build that self-confidence from within? Mm. How do I really understand like what really matters? And so mm. there's something beautiful, be beautiful about having kids is if you learn from them. I think mm. there's a lot of people having kids who think we're the experts. And I'm like, listen, the kids know everything that they need to. We're just mm. here to guide them. And mm -hmm when you see how whole and innocent a child is and they don't care what they look like, what they're wearing, mm -hmm. if they're farting away at dinner, they, there's no shame. We put shame on them for those things. We tell yeah. them that's inappropriate. Yeah. Um, you know, we tell them, we, we tell them the rules of the living in this society and culture. Yeah. Right. So I've been unlearning a lot of shame actually from my kids and just yeah. realizing that, wow, they don't see my body as negative. Like I remember one time my daughter, she was probably three. And she's like, um, she's like, oh, you're fat, like pointing at my stomach. And I, I was like, I was like, yep, I have fat there. Yeah. 
And I, I was like, first I was like, I wanted to be like, no, I'm not fat. It's just a small part of my body. And, um, or like blame it on having kids be like, Oh, the reason I'm like, this is because of you. I've yeah. heard that so much. I'm like, Hey, don't blame your children for anything because there's a lot of people who are, who are fat, who have fat yeah. without ever having children. So what is yeah. that telling your child that you can only be that way because you've had kids? Yeah. So I just say, yep. And I'm trying not to react because fat is not a bad word. Yeah. Our society has just labeled that as fat. So, um, the, yeah, there's a lot of even body hair. I've told my, my daughter, I have a daughter and a son and I'm like, yep, mommy shaves because I'm trying to fit into what society thinks I should be like. That is the only reason. Yeah. There's no other reason. I'm, I'm yeah. lazy. I would rather not at all. And mostly I actually don't, but sometimes I do when I'm wearing a swimsuit or if I'm going out or something and, yeah. um, that's, you know, a lot of women will say, oh, cause I want to, I feel, I feel better that way. And I'm like, interesting that we feel better without hair, but men mm-hmm. don't. Mm-hmm. And that's culturally and societally, so- socially learned. So mm-hmm. it's okay. It's okay. Mm-hmm. If you want to do those things, it's just, mm-hmm. I, I want to make, be clear to my kids that this is not how you have to be. Mm-hmm. This is just what mommy is choosing to do mm-hmm. to fit in. Mm. at this moment in, in time. Right. Mm. And so mm. I want them critically thinking of like, mm. Oh, what do I want to do? Yeah. Oh, all my friends play with Spider-Man. Yeah. Well, what do you want to do? Yeah. My kids come home every day and they're like Spidey, Spidey. Oh, that's a Spidey color. I'm like, I don't know what that means. They're like, it's a Spidey blue or red or something. And I never grew up watching these shows. So and my kids don't watch yeah. these shows yet. And you know, it's happening. It's happening. It, it will probably happen yeah. at some point, but they're still young. And I'm like, you know, let's delay all this stuff as long as, as possible. much as possible. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so it's just interesting because no matter what, like, I wish we were taught that critical thinking of like, how do you actually want to be? How do you interact with these social norms? Cause yeah. they're not going to disappear. It's always going to be there. No. And the norms might shift over time. Yeah. Um, it's like the eyebrow nineties eyebrows were p- pencil thin. Right. And yeah. everyone was just like, plucking them. I never look good with pencil thin eyebrows because I've got thicker eyebrows. So I never bothered. And now my eyebrows are in. Right. So everyone's oh, like, yeah, oh, yeah. where did you get your eyebrows done? I'm like, I have not touched. It's like, them. ooh, natural. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, so genetics. Yeah, exactly. And that's going to change in 10 years. And, you know, it's going to go, fl- it's going to fluctuate. So yeah. I realized like, I'm not a trend. I'm not trying to fit into some box of what people think I should be like, because the pressure yeah. is definitely not for my home. It's not for my husband. It's not for my family. It's this internalized pressure from growing up here. And I think mm-hmm. also the intersections, like you said, of being an immigrant mm-hmm. and you try often as an immigrant, especially of a visible, you know, black, yeah, brown, yeah. visibly not white immigrant you try harder to fit in and not stand out because it's safer. It's survival. Mm -hmm. And now when you do stand out for things that are not positive or not seen positively, it's, it kind of shakes your whole self-confidence. Right. And Mm -hmm. I want to talk about this openly because I think it, this happens and people don't talk about it. They live it, it lives inside them in shame. And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of the shame has been released because I've talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. you said so much and I'm like, I have so many things to add to this. Um, the one thing that I do want to say as it turns to visible minority and being able to kind of stand in your own space is that you can be hyper visible and hyper invisible at the same yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. And this is a term that I learned from uh, Stephanie Lurch, who is um, a fantastic physiotherapist at U of T. And she is the head or one of the heads or co-heads for the summer mentorship program for physiotherapy. And this uh, program helps health, um, high school students see if they're interested in different fields within the healthcare pro- uh, profession. Amazing. So when she was talking about hyper visible and hyper invisible, it really resonated with me because like in certain situations, that's all people can see. Yeah. That is all they can yeah. see. But in other situations in which your culture needs to be taken into account, they kind of gloss over that. Yeah. It's like you yeah. don't exist, right? Or like yeah. that doesn't exist. And that doesn't exist. I love that term. I haven't heard it. And it, 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 is so accurate describing, you know, so it much really of how is. we feel. And 
that's hyper visible and hyper invisible. And it's interesting because for so long I was desperate to be invisible and just blend mm. in. Right. And just like, <laughs> and now I'm like, the things that I um, cut out of my own life to blend yeah. in are yeah. everything that ties me to who I am. Yeah. And so it um, even there's so many years every year, even today, even this year, Diwali is our biggest holiday as people mm -hmm. who are Hindus. And I, t I tell everybody, I'm like, it's Diwali, I'm not answering business work related questions. Yeah. Even with my clients, I'm like, I'm like, you can email me. I just won't get back to you till after. And they don't even bother me, but it's yeah. fellow physiotherapists who completely don't even recognize. I'm like, would you message someone on Christmas and ask them for a reference letter? Tell me mm -hmm. Christmas morning, Christmas mm -hmm. Eve, would you be messaging them that? No. Yeah. So why do you not have the same respect for people who are celebrating Diwali, Eid, Hanukkah, you know, whatever other holidays that yeah. are not Christian holidays. So yeah. it's this complete lack of disrespect and this, that hyper invisibility, like, oh yeah, you're celebrating some holiday. We see your pictures. We see you dressing up, but we don't care because yeah. we, we have this question and it needs to be asked now. Yeah. Um, and these are people who are very successful physiotherapists. They're not just like new grads. So yeah. it, it tells me that I'm like, if they're treating me that way, how are they treating their clients? For sure. For sure. And that's very, very important because it makes me kind of think about boundaries and maintaining boundaries because people will test your boundaries. They will. It's up to you to be able to maintain it yeah. and have the strength and courage to continue to maintain it all ways all the that, time that is not something that you want to take your foot off the pedal with yeah because once you let it slide it Ooh. just magnifies right and so this exactly. year i was like you know what if anybody messages me if they're messaging me to say happy diwali great yeah. but if they're asking me something else i'll just be like hey it's diwali can you message me next week so yeah. that then they're like oh i'm so sorry i yeah and so it's not to make people feel bad. It's to make people stop to recognize the whole person in me. I'm like, I'm not just a physiotherapist. Yeah. I'm a, an Indian, Canadian, Hindu, brown, you know, immigrant physiotherapist. There's so many other identities, mom, yeah. you know, wife, yeah. there's so many other identities yeah. that I hold. And if you only see me for one compartment of me, then that doesn't respect me as a whole human. And I think what you do for your clients is the exact same. Yeah. You're not just saying, oh, you're just this endo patient or this yeah. postpartum patient. You're, you're this and yes, all of this. Yeah. And I think like when we start talking about, okay, how do we, <laughs> I hate the term, <laughs> not hate, but like, I understand it, but how do we assimilate and not stand out? There is no chance of me not standing out. It's, it's not going to happen. Like no. I am very tall. I have a giant head. Like it's just not. Listen, you're a tall, beautiful black woman, and just and you happening. have an you have a English slash Nigerian Nigerian it's, accent. It's, yeah. 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 So for anyone that's out there who this resonates with, embrace it. Yeah. I embraced it at a very young age, and it has become something that is now. I won't say it's my superpower, but it's just more like, this is who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And it also helps and assists in terms of maintaining boundaries as well. And I always talk about maintaining boundaries because there are times where people will test your boundaries over and over again. And for me, I started to learn that people don't actually have to respect your boundaries. It's you that has to respect your own boundaries. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm saying this often, and I know we talked about it just now, but I have to say it again, because once you are able to understand why this is important to you, then nothing can actually touch you at that point. Hmm. That's such a powerful statement. Yeah. And I think like, I know that as we navigate this world, there are different things that come into vogue. There are different things that come out of vogue. But once you know yourself, yes. and once you know your North Star or who you're becoming, then yeah, it may take you a while to get there. But nothing can deter you off that path. And I think that's important to know, especially as any physiotherapist coming in, because like there's so much information out there. There's unlimited. Yeah. And even healthcare practitioners as well. And this actually brings me to the next point that you said. And I love this term, 
critical thinking. Mm. I feel like in every grade, we need to have a course on critical thinking. Yeah. It needs to be integrated into every aspect of our education. It does. Because I believe that we have almost lost the ability to think critically. And for me, I think that's by design, because if you start teaching mm. children how to critically think, they might not agree and be obedient for their teachers. So when you think about the school, the school, the education system, which I have immense respect for, teachers are like so invaluable, but you keep people in line by telling them what to do, not how to think. And so um, even parents with their children, they don't want their children to think why. That's why this question, why, why is so irritating for many parents, including me at times, because <laughs> you're like, oh, just do what I say, right? Yeah. But for me, like, and this is, I do think this needs to be taught in schools because not all parents have the privilege or luxury to parent their children. When yeah. I moved here, my parents were busy all the time trying to find jobs, work two, three jobs. I didn't see them. And I was yeah. 10. And yeah. so it was isolating as a child. And so whatever I learned in school was what I learned. Yeah. And, you know, with when we're able to teach children how to critically think, they become adults who can critically think. Yes. They become adults who just don't follow the next trend because it's trendy. And they're yes. actually like, do I actually need this? Do I want yeah. this? Do I believe yeah. this? Yeah. And so I'm hoping, I'm hopeful anyways for the future because I find kids now because of social media, that it could go either way. It's toxic in many ways, but they're also able to connect and they're able to see with their own eyes how kids live in other parts of the world. They're able yes. to see what is what is truly happening around the world. And yes. I do think that they're a bit more empowered to stand up for themselves and yes. set those boundaries. And yes. um, yeah, but critically thinking is, is, it is a lost. Like I think most people have lost that ability because they yeah. don't practice it. It's a skill they, they have not practiced as much. Yeah. You said something in the beginning where you like, it's by design. As soon as you said that, like it resonated in my bones. And I was like, this is so true. Yes. Yeah. If you can just have people just be led as sheep from one place to another, especially as it pertains to the healthcare system, then it's easy to manage. It's also easy to monetize as well. Yeah. But if people are asking themselves, why are we doing this the way that we're doing it? Why for me and questioning what is occurring, then they're actually able to understand a little bit more and also as they go into it, they're going into it genuinely and whole with their whole self being like, oh, this is why. Yes. Yeah. So as we are kind of talking about critical thinking, I do feel like, especially within the healthcare industry, for both patients and also practitioners, we also have to question why we're doing what we're doing. Yes. And even more prevalent within the OBGYN, reproductive health space. Because a lot of these practices were based on a historical context that has been wildly disproven. Yes. So many things in, yeah. in, in the birth experience, like the eye gel, the antibiotic eye gel that they just plaster all over newborns when most people don't have syphilis or gonorrhea or whatever this STI yeah. is. And so, but these practices have just prevailed, you know, birthing and lithotomy. Like there's so many yes. practices that yes. just don't make sense. And we, and you know, it's interesting because not only do we encourage our patients to not critically think and ask questions, we as practitioners have also not asked our supervisors and mentors and profs why, why? or yeah. we are not taught as students. And so we become then, the same students now become the practitioners. And now yeah. we we get scared when our patients are smart and ask questions and we're like, oh, why do they, why don't they just listen to me? It's like, yeah. that's not their job. Yeah. I used to be scared. Now I love it. I yes. love it. And I also love taking interns because when they ask why, I'm like, you know what? I don't know. That's a project for you. <laughs> You come up with these answers and make a presentation and we can discuss this. Yes. But it also, it really helps you to kind of challenge your biases and also challenge like all the things that you've learned and are trying to unlearn at this point in time. And as it pertains to healthcare as well, it's very dangerous because if we don't challenge why certain things are the way that we do, it's only going to perpetuate. 
And exactly. as technology and healthcare are coming together, this becomes even more dangerous. It really does. Yeah, because then technology just compounds biases, stereotypes, unconscious bias, implicit bias, all of those things. So then this, it makes it really dangerous for certain groups of people. Yeah. So we owe it to ourselves to be able to unpack that and also understand within the healthcare system why we do what we do, especially as it pertains to pain management, okay. especially as it pertains to race and pain management. Yes. Yeah. So like we've heard, we've heard the reference and we've heard the statistics in terms of three to four Black women dying in childbirth compared to their counterparts. And we also hear in terms of like how pain management is managed in people of color versus mm. people compared to their other counterparts as well. Yeah. So if we take that and we add technology on top of that, what is that going to look like from an insurance perspective? From right. A patient care perspective. The models of care that we are currently working with, what do we need to do in order to ensure that we're not harming certain groups? Yeah. So, Because if we're following, like if t t technology might determine, oh, this is the pain, pain medication to give to mm -hmm. this client based on their age, size, race, mm -hmm. whatever. And that we assume, I think we blind, I think a lot of humans, myself included, don't understand technology enough, especially of our generation, because we didn't necessarily grow up with this level of technology, yeah. we grow up with the internet. Yeah. And so when we don't understand something, we just are like, it must work because it's fancy. And it just, <laughs> it's so quick, you know, I just input this and then this is, this pops up. But yeah. And we assume that because there's something in a research paper, it must be accurate because there's yeah. something online that it must be accurate. And it's dangerous. It can it's be dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> um, and I think the other component that you kind of mentioned a little, or we haven't really talked about, but is the self-care piece. Because mm -hmm. as practitioners, the busier you are, the more likely you are going to be to have these biases mm -hmm. and these prejudices show up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a big component to why so many physiotherapists and healthcare providers are not giving people optimal care. It's not that mm -hmm. they're you know, mean or trying to be cruel. It's just that they're behaving like a toddler because they're overwhelmed, they're busy. And so they're just doing the first thing that comes into their brain without yeah. considering differentials, without really truly listening to the person. Yeah. Because if you have five to eight minutes with your doctor, yes. you're trying to just get in and say the most urgent thing. And when you yeah. start to speak up with the second thing, they're like, no, book a separate appointment. Yes. And that's, that's the system, healthcare system yeah. where we're at. And it sucks. Yeah. It so does. we have to, that busyness of like, I see 14 patients a day and I'm so proud of it. Like people almost wear that as a point of um, pride, right? And our first, that clinic that you worked at initially, that OHIP clinic, OHIP for those people don't know, it's like publicly funded healthcare Ontario, in Ontario. How many patients were we seeing a day? Like 412, 70? like Wait, what? 412, like I'm joking, but it felt like it was back to back to back to back to back to back to back. It was literally just a line. Five, patients. five like, minutes maybe per patient. Yeah. And you're doing like a mobilization stretch and then boom, you're going to the next bed. And yeah, like, it's not that people don't get better. Some people still do get better in that model, but mm -hmm. It's not personalized. It's, it's not. not thorough or comprehensive. And it can be really risky because you can miss. I was thinking, you know, how many people with shoulder pain and chest pains may have cancer? Yeah. And we just address it like, oh, it's arthritis because you're old. And yeah. now we're going to stretch that. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, we have not even stopped to really consider all of the scan and the red flag items because we yeah. haven't had time to talk to the person. Yeah. I definitely feel like when it pertains to healthcare and business, I do want to say burnout is real, um, and I hope no one ever experiences it. It is demoralizing. That's the best way I can put it. And I do feel like um, that badge of I'm so busy, for what? To what end? What value does that bring to you? And 
that's fine. In different stages of life, you definitely need to grind and hustle and burn the midnight oil and et cetera. But what is the purpose behind it? Is and how it long is that going to last? Is yeah. it sustainable? Is it sustainable? Yeah. So for self-care and healthcare practitioners, to be quite honest, healthcare practitioners, I honestly think that we have been given the bad end of the stick because yeah. with any helping profession, people really expect you to do it for free and they don't value what you bring to the table as it pertains to, okay, I am caring for you in this way. Yeah. yeah. So being able to, once again, set boundaries, understand your self-worth and also be able to educate yourself continuously on what is good practice and what is important for both you and the patient is only going to lead to better outcomes for both parties practitioners tell me tell me from you from your perspective because you've worked over a decade Mm -hmm. what do you find i always ask this question yeah what do you do for self-care every day three things that you're doing every day that you think will help you as not just a practitioner, but as a person feel truly kind of taken care of. Yeah. I pray. I have a very interesting relationship with God. My faith is very, very strong. It has to be. Yeah. I exercise a lot. That is the best way for me to alleviate any stress, but also prepare for the day. Because ah. I feel like once I've done that, then it's like, oh, I am ready. So you work out in the morning? I I have to. And that's yeah. amazing. And it depends on the different stage I am. But um, when I'm working out, sometimes if I have a tough like day ahead of me, I literally yeah. feel like I'm preparing for battle. <laughs> it really <laughs> does. Like, I feel like I'm training for battle. Yeah. And then when, as soon as I leave, I'm like, let's do this. Yeah, let's you're ready. Go. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, I do uh, participate in team, team sports. And that to me is really, really important. Yeah. I love um, being able to just have that team dynamic on the field where you're not thinking of anything specifically. You're thinking of the game. You're just and- present. You're fully there. So present. Yeah. I feel like when I'm playing sports, that's when I'm my most genuine, authentic self. That's amazing. What sports do you play? So I do. (laughs) You're like, um, from A to Z, these are the 18 different sports that I'm amazing at. (laughs) No, not amazing, but definitely like really enjoying. And currently it's ultimate frisbee and squash. Uh, Ultimate frisbee. Tough sports. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like one of those sports where you're just kind of like, I'm sorry, you do what? This is a sport? Are, are you sure? Yeah. I played ultimate. It is 100% a sport and it's way harder than people think it is. It is and so way more fun too. It's exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you still play? So I just got a Facebook memory, December 6th, yeah. I think, where I hadn't played since I think it had been 11 years since I played. Yeah. Because I injured my right ankle really oh, badly. Yeah. High ankle sprain fully. Yeah. I've sprained it many times since high school, yeah. um, running track, cross country, whatever it is. And that was the worst sprain I've had. It was a mm-hmm. uh, 9 PM game to 10 PM. And I was on my team and then 10 PM, I was going to leave. This is on a Wednesday night. I remember yeah. all these details Yeah, and they're like, we need an extra girl. Can you sub in? I'm like, sure. Why not? I hadn't no. eaten dinner. No, I was exhausted. Recipe for disaster. I probably st- slept like five hours a night before because I was Absolutely I was that not. type of person back then. Hard no. And at t- this was now nine to ten. I played ten to eleven. I'm playing. It was like ten fifty five. I want to Almost barf. done. Yeah. And I nobody was even covering me. I literally just went to turn directions, change directions. My ankle gave out. I fell, Ugh. and I tried to stand up, and I was like. I think I broke my ankle. Like I it literally puffed up by the time I got home. My friend like helped me home. And then the next morning it was like the size of my calf or my oh my, uh, my thigh. It was yeah. awful. I and so that. back then I was not a good physio student. I was a physio at the time too, but I was not I a good say student something. At physio. Yeah. I feel like healthcare practitioners are the worst patients. Worst patients. Worst patients. So, so like, this is as- what I sh- this is what you shouldn't do. Ignore it. 
but I did all the like contrast baths, ice, all that heat, all that stuff. But I did like mobility, but I went into work the next day because I Mm. didn't want to take a day off and be Mm. disappointing to my patients. Mm. I went into work and then I was in so much pain. The manager was like, do you want to go get an x-ray or something? Like I can get you in with the doctors across the street. I'm like, yes. I was like in tears, got an x-ray. Thankfully it wasn't actually fractured, which I was like convinced it was based on the swelling. But it was a severe sprain and it took yeah. a long time to heal. I also avoided getting back to ultimate and running because I was oh, scared no. of injury. Oh, no. So I stopped playing since then. And oh. I really miss it because the team sport dynamic, it's fun. It's awesome. You get this like camaraderie going and it's awesome. like, it is really fun. So yeah. well, I, when you said that, I was like, oh, I miss playing ultimate. Well, maybe we'll invite you and you can sub in for a couple of games. See how you feel. It's true. Yeah. You still play through the winter? Yeah. Indoors? Still, yeah. Yeah. Nice. So like right now it's Monday evenings and it's like the best. Um, but in terms of like physios being the worst patients, I tore my MCL completely Ooh. this summer. And oh. I continued playing on it like a fool. I did not know. I had some imaging. And as soon as I realized it was a complete tear, I like stopped. But for four weeks, I played. We are, we, we are the worst patients. I think we think yeah. we're immune to these things sometimes. Invisible. Yeah. We're, and we're like, invisible. yeah. I honestly, and when it happens to us, we're like, oh no, like we're, we're those patients now. And yeah. I, but I do think that most physios have had their version of injuries. And I think yeah. it makes us more empathetic. 1000%. Because- we we get it we get yeah. how much it sucks i've i've stopped playing things and I even stopped rock climbing because of a wrist injury oh, no. and so there's so many activities that i've given up and now i would because of having kids i actually have learned so much about my body and it's not about giving up what you what provokes symptoms it's about strengthening and training yeah. to be able to do those things yes. and not giving them up yes whereas before i think early on in my career i remember telling runners and this is something that i wish i could take back runners would come in especially older runners like 50s 60s and their knee would hurt and i'd be like oh you probably should slow down and not run as much and i would never say that to someone now mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. i would talk about activity modification and yeah. volume but yeah. i would never say give up on the thing that brings you the you most joy, joy. Exactly. And, but that's how we're taught, right? We're taught, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. If you keep poking yourself in the eye and it hurts, just stop poking yourself in the eye. Yeah. Okay. But this person loves to do X, Y, Z, and you're telling them not to do it is they're not coming back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so self-care, tell me one thing, if you change one thing about the world right now, what would it be? Ooh. Compassion. I would love compassion. for more people to have more empathy and compassion. What are you really passionate about right now? I am. That is a great question. I am really passionate about getting to understand and know my purpose. Wow. Yeah. And I don't mean in just one area, but in all stages I think like there's so many transitions that are happening right now and as purpose becomes more defined it just becomes a north star that is not shakeable yeah so and that and that's um I love that you said it's like not just it's not just work purpose no it's like absolutely you, not right it's, it literally is like a life purpose yeah amazing and I know that that's going to translate into work in some way shape or form I yes. love, love helping people, specifically women, specifically women of color. Yeah. I love celebrating. I love highlighting. I love guiding. I love understanding, listening. I honestly just feel like there's so much impact that women can bring to the world, positive, constructive. And I also know the generational impact that can flow from it. So if I can just help one woman, I know there's going to be like a huge ripple effect. It's true. I never thought about it that way. That ripple effect of helping. Huge, huge. And I love when people Mm. begin to love themselves. That to me is like, I love that feeling. 
I love that feeling. Yeah. So and I think what... many people don't recognize that they don't actually love themselves until <laughs> they start to do the work and they're like, oh, like that. And that was me. You would have seen me many years ago and think, wow, you're so confident. Everyone's like, you're so confident. And I'm like, I, and I, in, inside, I'd be like, what? I'm so insecure. But now that I truly understand how to love myself and all of yeah. myself, um, I feel like that's made my life so much more valuable or not valuable, but enriching and rich. Okay. So one last question before we wrap up, okay. what do you think is your biggest strength? Oh, my biggest strength. <laughs> my biggest strength is listening and understanding. Yeah. I, I enjoy listening to people's stories. I really do. We, so for those of you who don't know, we met up for dinner last week and literally like Joanne is such a good question asker and listener. And like, you, you are incredible at, at that as a human, which obviously translates to your work. I want to thank you so much for being here today. How can people connect with you? Email, social media, what's the best way? Social media is good. It's okay. right now a uh, desolate wasteland, but it will get there. Yeah. That's all right. So, yeah. And then also email as well. So I love when people reach out, even if it's any questions, happy to do that and then go from there. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Joanne. I will share all the details in the show notes. Um, and I can't wait for people to hear this conversation. If you listened to this episode and found it helpful, please share it with a fellow physiotherapist, friend, healthcare provider, patient. If you're a patient yourself, share it with your friends as well, because I think there's so much in this conversation that we can all learn from.